So the title of this session is Media Perception and the Consolidation of Brazilian Democracy. And it seems to me that the Brazilian press suffers from some structural weaknesses that are actually making it difficult to consolidate democracy in Brazil. And I'm not talking about individual journalists. I think Brazil's got some wonderful journalists, some wonderful commentarists, and in some ways, I think, they're better than we have in England. But I'm talking actually about the media industry itself. And I'm going to talk about that with reference to the current crisis. And if I have time, I'll also talk briefly about the role of the foreign press in this crisis, which I think has been unusual and interesting. It is perhaps a bit of a truism to say that in Brazil, the grande imprensa, the big mainstream press, is dominated by a few families, all of them highly conservative. Mino Carta, who is one of Brazil's leading left-wing journalists and currently editor of Carta, uh, Carta Capital, has described the Brazilian press, press as reactionary and conservative and attached by its umbilical cord to power and those holding power. But it is not just analysts in Brazil who say this. The NGO, Reporters Without Borders, an international NGO that promotes and defends freedom of information and freedom of the press, agrees, though it doesn't use quite as colorful language as Mino Carta did. It said in its latest report, the ownership of the media in Brazil remains very concentrated in the hands of powerful industrial families that are frequently close to the political class. Brazilian media coverage of the country's current political crisis has highlighted the problem. In a barely veiled manner, the leading national media have urged the public to help bring down President Dilma Rousseff. The journalists working for these media groups are clearly subject to the influence of private and partisan interests. And these permanent conflicts of interest are clearly very detrimental to the quality of their reporting. The Reporter Without Borders also highlights the problem of violence against journalists. It said, with seven journalists murdered in 2015 alone, Brazil continues to be the Western Hemisphere's third deadliest country for media personnel after Mexico and Honduras. All of them were investigating sensitive subjects such as corruption and organized crime. It was because of this violence against journalists and the media concentration which distorted its coverage that Reporters Without Borders downgraded Brazil in terms of freedom of the press. It now ranks Brazil in number 104, 104th out of 180 countries. And it clearly believes that the situation is getting worse. In 2010, Brazil ranked 58th. So it's almost, it's, it's got almost double, it's gone from 58 to 100 in ranking out of 180 countries. And I think the hostility towards the PT that the Reporters Without Borders refers to has been there since the PT was formed in the 1980s. I think what happens is that this hostility ebbs and flows and becomes particularly evident at times when the status quo is threatened. The first time I noticed it was way back in 1989 when it seemed that Lula might win the presidency at his first time, at his first attempt. And I'm certainly um, old enough and long with enough experience in Brazil to remember this. I mean, there's one incident that became notorious and is still discussed, which was on the eve of the voting in the second round, David Globo maliciously edited a debate between the two presidential candidates, Lula and Colody Mello, so that it showed Lula's worst moments and Collor's best moments. This manipulation of the news may have been at least partly responsible for Lula's defeat. And I think today is another delicate moment when the establishment clearly wants to get the PT out of government. The bias is very evident in the editorials of the mainstream press. The journalist Sileide Alves analyzed the press editorials for the first four months of this year. The Estadão published 83 editorials against Dilma, Globo 29, and the Folha de São Paulo of Fewer, um, 23. Uh, does this matter? Newspapers all over the world take positions. I mean, you just have to take, think of Britain at the moment and, and the very strong positions that our press is taking over the, the EU referendum. 
And I personally don't think it matters, and perhaps it's the responsibility of journalists to take positions. What matters is when the editorial position taken by the media distorts the way it covers the, the news. In the other way, it gets, in other words, it gets when it gets in the way of clear and honest reporting of the news. I think this is to some degree happening in, in Britain at the moment with the reporting of the EU ref referendum. We're even getting some, I can think of the Mail and the Sun, which actually uh, publish lies of, on, on, on what's going on. And I also think it's um, happening in Brazil. This is broadly the position taken by, too, by João Ferres, the coordinator of Manchetometro, an organization that monitors bias in the Brazilian press. After examining in detail, week after week, the Brazilian press, he concluded, there, it is no exaggeration to say that the Brazilian press manipulates public opinion. Looking at the coverage of the current crisis, perhaps the clearest case, once again, is Tiva Global. Um, earlier this year, I spent over a month in, in the Amazon doing some reporting there in a very uh, remote area. And as often happens in these areas, they have, they, one family will have television with, with a satellite and everybody comes in the evening to, to, to watch the novella de soi to the soap opera and then they listen to Journal National. Well, it was the time when uh, Lula uh, w was being investigated um, for corruption and he was taken handcuffed um, to give statements. And there was reported, <coughs> reporting of <coughs> alleged corruption among PT politicians without the same stress on even greater alleged involvement of non-PT politicians. It gave the impression that the PT was the, only, the most corrupt party when in fact there's no basis for saying it is more corrupt than the others and, it's pro and the evidence is that it's probably less. I was actually quite shocked a night after night going from one peasant hut to another and seeing that this is the news that they get. This is, this is, this is the reports they're getting about what's going on at this moment of an extreme political crisis um, in, in, in Brazil. And the unfairness in the treatment of the PT has, of course, struck many Brazilian analysts, including Celso Rocha de Barros, who's a columnist for the Folha de São Paulo. <coughs> He's one of the group of excellent journalists if I referred to above, and he has documented how the media follows obsessively corruption stories about the PT while downplaying or ignoring equally shocking corruption stories involving politicians from other parties. <laughs> And there are numerous other exa examples of distortion, not just by TV Global, but by many other parts of the mainstream media. You don't often see outright lies, more common omissions and indirect forms of manipulation. Each incident might seem fairly trivial, but it adds up to serious distortion. Let's take three examples provided by Calle Dois, a digital magazine. On the day before the impeachment was voted on, Globo News was reporting on the statements made for or against impeachment by deputies in the Chamber of Deputies. Globo News chose to leave the live transmissions and to get a comment from one of its journalists or another commentator exactly when a pro-government, a pro-Dilma deputy was speaking. So it gave the impression, without actually saying it, that all the Chamber supported the impeachment. The second example. Soon after Michel Temer came to office on the 18th of April, it was revealed that the main ministers in his new government were being investigated as part of the Lava Jato probe or being cited in testimonies. This was clearly an important development and was widely reported by the foreign press. But it took the Folie de São Paulo a fortnight to tell its re the readers about this development. And according to Calio Dois, this only happened after it, Calio Dois, had contact contacted the Folia Ombudsman. And even then, says Calidois, it wasn't dealt with in a satisfactory way. Third example. When the Brazilian jurist, Janaina Pascual, took part in a debate in the Senate on the 20th April, she admitted that she'd received 45,000 reais from the PSI de Bay to draw up her parecer, her legal argument, which is the basis on which the demand for Dilma's impeachment is being made. This is obviously an important piece of information, 
because it suggests that the Parasa may not be an impartial legal document, but something commissioned by the PSD debate, which is the party which is pressing most strongly for the impeaching, impeachment. But on the following day, neither the Folia nor the Estado newspapers had a report on, the, on this. Does this all matter? I think it does. We're seeing the emergence of new sources of information, alternative websites, Publica, uh, Media Ninja, Flux, or Nex, or Intermedia, Connectors, and so on. But at the moment, the, it's the mainstream media that sets the agenda. The Peite promised us to reform the media and even to set up an independent um, government-funded news agency, something similar to the BBC, or, but it didn't deliver. I think, and I think we, we still need reforms urgently in Brazil if democracy is to be consolidated. Now briefly, a, a, a note on the role played by the Brazilian press, on the foreign press. I think on the whole, the foreign press has covered the crisis well. Though of course it's easier to avoid political bias if you're covering a country a long way off and not usually high in the news agenda of your own country. What is interesting is the way the coverage changed. In the beginning, the foreign press tended to cover the anti-Dilma uh, protests fairly uncritically. It was as if the press was seduced by the excitement of millions going onto the street to protest against corruption. But then doubts grew as to the legitimacy of the decision to open a process to impeach Dilma. Perhaps a turning point was the vote in the Chamber of Deputies. On the 17th of April, as you all know, Brazil was a big news story, a breaking news story. For the, it took it for the eight hours it took for the voting to, go, to take place. And, and while the Brazilian media tended to cover the story rather like a sports event with the latest score recorded on boards, the foreign press began to look at the politics. It was shocked by the tone adopted by some of the deputies. This is how The Guardian described part of it. On a dark night, arguably the lowest point was when Jair Bolsonaro, the far-right deputy from Rio de Janeiro, dedicated his yes vote to Carlos Brilhante Ulstra, the colonel who headed the, Codi, the Doi Codi torture unit during the dictatorship era. Rousseff, a former guerrilla, was among those tortured. Bolsonaro's move prompted left-wing deputy Jean Willis to spit towards him. Eduardo Bolsonaro, his son, and also a deputy, used his time at the microphone to honor the general responsible for the military coup in 1964. And the foreign press also began to report on the grotesqueness of having deputies who were themselves deeply involved in corruption, accusing Dilma of corruption. That this change was clear in the coverage of, of, uh, in the US. Um, in the New York Times, the Wall Street, and Washington Post, and in, all began to talk about the grotesque of having these very corrupt um, deputies talking about corruption in the PT. And in Europe, Der Spiegel, the German magazine, went as far as dubbing the vote the uprising of the hypocrites. And the, the New York Times and later, I mean, as we all know, it's a pretty conservative newspaper, even carried a fairly strong editorial which was entitled Global Medal for Corruption. And it said, while well, Ms. Kusov has not managed the country effectively, the Senate's relishing her exit must remember that the president was elected twice. The Workers' Party still has considerable support, particularly under the millions it pulled out of poverty over the last two decades. Confidence in Ms. Kusov and her party may have plunged in recent months, but Ms. Khrushchev is poised to play a disproportionately high price for administrative wrongdoing, while several of her most ardent detractors stand accused of more egregious crimes. They may find that much of the ire that has been focused on her will soon be redirected at them. This is strong words for a, for a paper like the, um, the, New, the New York Times. Um, more predictably, Al Jazeera, the Qatar news agency, was critical not only of the impeachment process itself, but of the coverage of the crisis in the Brazilian media. I think it was the, the first to describe what was going on in Brazil as a coup. And this is something that has been adopted more in the, um, the, the foreign press now, particularly after those um, recordings came out in which it became clear 
that many of those, or some of the leaders who were pushing for impeachment were actually wanting Dilma impeached to, to stop La Fajata. That was the point in which Glenn Greenwald from, from The Intercept said, who had resisted, rather like I had in the beginning, to call it a coup. He, uh, hearing these, uh, these transcriptions, I, I think there is, I, I think I now actually think it is a, a, a coup, that what we've got is a, a Congress which trying to get rid of, of Dilma uh, in, in elections. They, they were defeated, but they have a strong position in Congress, and now they're, they're trying to use a, legit, a, a legitimate constitutional, constitutional procedure to try and get rid of her. I don't think many Brazilians really think it's the Pedaladas Fiscais which are behind their wish to get to rid of Dilma. It's a battle for power. It, it, they, uh, they want to get, to get her out, to, go, to, to, to push ahead even more strongly on the neoliberal um, um, measures. Uh, anyway, this is not really what we was, I thought we were supposed to be discussing in, the, <laughs> in this. I'm just, I'm just finishing. I'm just finishing. Gente. Gente, por favor. I, I've just let me. I've got three more minutes. I just, I just make a few more comments, and I'll, I'll keep it to three minutes. This foreign reporting, which was looking at angles of the story not covered by the mainstream press in Brazil, had consequences in Brazil. More than any country I know, Brazil is intrigued by the way it gets covered abroad. Your um, news stories and features tend to be either translated or quoted from at length in the Brazilian media. In this way, I think the Brazilian media, media played an important role in bringing to the attention of many Brazilians new aspects of the Congress. It broke through the monolithic walls of the mainstream press and helped explain to Brazilians why a significant section of the population was calling what was happening a coup. Uh, this was something that the mainstream press in Brazil was not really even discussing, and I think there is a debate about whether a coup or not, and I think it helps to drive home the point I made earlier. For democracy to be consolidated in Brazil, the mainstream press in Brazil has to change. Thank you. Obrigado. Gente, peço que, por favor, respeitem aqui os, os palestrantes. Vamos é, primeiro agradecer a Sul por trazer uma visão crítica, que é necessária no, de, no debate de, é, democrático. E eu gostaria, é, pela necessidade do debate democrático, eu vou dar um tempo para o Otávio responder pelo fato da Folha ter sido citada no discurso dela. Eu agradeço pela oportunidade e, nesta altura, eu tenho uma crítica a fazer aos organizadores do evento, porque me parece que para essa mesa foram convidados dois jornalistas e uma terceira pessoa que é, tem uma visão que corresponde a uma visão da militância do PT. Sinto falta de uma quarta pessoa... Sinto falta de uma quarta pessoa na mesa que representasse a militância do PSDB. Eu, infelizmente, não poderei fazer esse papel porque fui educado numa escola de jornalismo segundo a qual cabe ao jornalismo ser crítica em relação a todas as fontes de poder, cabe ao jornalista se desengajar, se distanciar e adotar uma visão de fiscalização e de crítica erga omnes. Essa é a minha escola de jornalismo, pelo que eu vejo, não é a da nossa colega britânica aqui da mesa. Eu vou me limitar a dizer duas coisas, não vou refutar cada uma das várias inverdades que apareceram no discurso que me antecedeu, porque tomaria inutilmente o tempo de vocês. Vou me limitar a dizer duas coisas. Primeiro, eu pessoalmente fui contra o impeachment. Como cidadão brasileiro, acho que o motivo era fraco, não era forte o suficiente para justificar um traumatismo tamanho 
como é o afastamento de um presidente ou de uma presidente é, eleita. E eu acho que o povo tem que aprender a arcar com as consequências de suas é, decisões eleitorais. Por essas razões, eu, como cidadão, fui contrário ao impeachment. No entanto, gostaria de responder dois aspectos ainda. Primeiro, a questão da propriedade dos meios de comunicação. Eu não acredito que se deva fetichizar essa questão. É, aquele que é consensualmente considerado o maior, melhor veículo de comunicação de informação jornalística no mundo, o New York Times, é um veículo de propriedade familiar, aliás, há muito tempo. No próprio Brasil, a revista de esquerda citada pela nossa debatedora britânica, a Carta Capital, é também uma publicação familiar. Quer dizer, a questão não é se a publicação é familiar é boa ou não, a questão é se a publicação familiar está a favor das minhas teses ou está contrária às minhas teses. A, a revista Carta Capital é uma publicação familiar a ponto de ter o nome da família no título. Seria algo equivalente a, sei lá, o jornal que eu represento aqui se chamasse Frias de São Paulo ou algo desse tipo. Um personalismo que me parece bastante evidente. É uma publicação familiar, tanto quanto as outras. Aliás, as melhores publicações jornalísticas do mundo são publicações familiares. Por quê? Porque as famílias assumem determinados compromissos que precisam ser resgatados ao longo do tempo. É diferente de um executivo que está lá só para obter lucro, em curto prazo, em seis meses, de um ano, e depois vai sair da empresa. A família tem um envolvimento de, em termos de imagem, em termos emocionais, em termos psicológicos, com um veículo que muitas vezes justifica a sustentação de um jornalismo de qualidade ao longo do tempo, como é o caso do New York Times, por exemplo. O segundo aspecto que eu comentaria, agradecendo a oportunidade dessa resposta, é essa questão da manipulação. Eu não acredito que mídia manipule ninguém, simplesmente porque eu acho que as pessoas não são imbecis, as pessoas sabem o que leem, sabem discernir, sabem votar, não precisam de orientação de ninguém. Eu acredito que cidadãos e cidadãs maduros, adultos, sabem decidir por si próprios. Por isso eu não acredito que exista manipulação de mídia. Se alguém está assistindo a Rede Globo, é porque a Rede Globo está prestando um serviço útil para aquele alguém. Eu não acredito que as pessoas sejam é, títeres, sejam fantoches, manipulados por quem quer que seja. Eu acho que as pessoas sabem tomar suas decisões adultas e sabem responder pelas decisões que tomam. E o segundo aspecto, e eu encerro aqui, é o seguinte, os críticos da mídia precisam chegar a uma conclusão. Ou a mídia está decadente, não tem importância mais nenhuma, foi superada pela internet, é obsoleta, é a velha mídia, ou a mídia é poderosa, manipuladora, controla tudo no Brasil. As duas coisas ao mesmo tempo, ela não consegue fazer. Precisa chegar num acordo. Obrigado pela oportunidade.